Well, I want to welcome everybody today to the Entrepreneur Show. My name is Heidi Richards Mooney. I'm your host today. I'm the founder of Women in E-Commerce, president of Redhead Marketing, and publisher of We Magazine for Women. And it is my honor, as always, as I always say, to uh, introduce you to another amazing woman who's a uh, Story is pretty interest is not only interesting, it's uh wow. Um, that's what I would call it. Uh, on a scale of one to ten, it's right up there on a ten. Uh, she's been through a lot and she survived, and we're gonna talk a little bit about what she has been through and hopefully give you some good tips if you're listening to help you if you're uh having any challenges in your life right now. So let me tell you a little bit about my guest today. Her name is Dr. Marilyn Joyce. For over 40 years, Dr. Marilyn, a registered dietitian with her doctorate in psychology and biochemistry and human nutrition, has been inspiring audiences around the world as a motivational and inspirational keynote speaker, seminar leader, and trainer. She has been the featured guest on Doctor to Doctor, Lisa, Montel Williams, Maury Povich, oh, that had to be interesting, PBS, and Jenny Jones. Dr. Joyce is the author of the best-selling books, Five Minutes to Health, I Can't Believe It's Tofu, and her much sought after book, Instant Energy, The Five Keys to Unlimited Energy and Vitality. The former director of nutrition for the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, Dr. Joyce is a five-time, listen to me, five-time cancer survivor, now 27 plus years thriver. Her seminar clients include Xerox, the FBI, Girl Scouts, and a host of others. Welcome, Dr. Joyce. Hello, Heidi. Thank you so much for inviting me to come on the show. Well, you know, I needed a little inspiration, and I thought our listeners could use a little inspiration. So you're just the perfect person for that. So thank you for being with us today. And I'm going to start right off with, wow, five-time cancer survivor and 27-year thrivers. Thriver, what do you think were the key ingredients to survive cancer five times? You know, I think that there's the survivor instinct in all of us, but in some of us, it may be more developed than others. And I, I you know, I was thinking about that a few days ago when I was having a conversation with an associate. And I really believe that, you know, because I started my life, my young life, basically as a runaway, I learned how to take care of myself and survive in the streets and when you survive uh you know a difficult childhood and then go from there on i think you just build a stronger and stronger survivorship as you progress through your years so that by the time i was diagnosed with cancer it was like i and i'm belligerent in a way <laughs> i like that is not going to kill me <laughs> so you know when they told me i didn't have any hope because it was uterine cancer and it was stage four. I mean, I was diagnosed with melanoma, but that was early stage that we got that. But with the uterine cancer, it was stage four and I was in my mid thirties. Wow. So I think that also had something to do with it though, because generally it was considered an older woman's illness. And so, and it d did run in my family. Two of my great aunts died from uterine cancer, but they were way older than that, you know? So, for me, I think my youth also had something to do with it. You know, the, the survivor instinct, uh, looking for the right tools and never giving up. I think too often we're just about there and we give up, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's dark, it's just before the dawn. And so, you know, there was that whole thing. And then, like I said, my youth, you know, being young enough to, to fight. And, and a lot of times with my patients over the years, They've been in their 80s and they haven't had the fight left in them. Yeah. So, you know, I think there is that aspect. People have said to me, if you were diagnosed with cancer again, would you do the same thing? Well, the way I feel right now, yes, I would. You know, I feel great at this point in my life. But, you know, who knows, really? Well, and, and you have that hindsight, too. So tell us a little bit yeah. about your background. Then I want to delve more into this because I'll tell you, you and I have a lot in common. Although I didn't have the cancer my mother did, she did survive uterine cancer, but then got breast cancer. And the second time she got it, she died. Um, but I had a difficult childhood and, you know, a lot of different things, abuse and everything else. My mom was married five times. I don't want to go into it, but I can tell you, I think that when you have those kind of, situations where life is not easy when you're young you tend to learn how to 
take on bigger challenges and, and cope. I think coping is a big deal. You know, some people turn to drugs today. It seems like more and more people are turning to drugs. But if you look at, uh, I would say our generation, you know, we coped in different ways. Maybe we, maybe some started out with drugs, not me, but I know friends who did, but I think that coping is a huge issue. So I hope we get into that a little bit, but tell us a little bit more about your background. Well, you know, it, it started as at home when I was six years old. Actually, my first recollection of really severe abuse was when I was three. Oh. But at six, my mom was diagnosed with uh, paranoid schizophrenia. Oh, God. And it was just a nightmare, quite honestly, Heidi. I really, from day to day, never knew if I was going to survive. And so by the time I was 14, I just had reached the end of the rope. And I just took a sheet, filled it with some clothes, and headed out on the road and hitchhiked my way across to, uh, well, first of all, into the town near me. That was too close. So then I had to hitchhike <laughs> <my> away. <laughs> and so I hitchhiked into Toronto. And, you know, it was interesting because I ended up going to Ryerson University for my undergraduate studies in biochemistry and human nutrition. And um, last year, I was invited to be the keynote speaker for the California uh, chapter. And uh, when I told my story very briefly about being a homeless runaway kid reaching into garbage cans to get cold pizza or frozen pizza because it was the only thing people had maybe not touched, right. you know, it was like as I reached in, I would watch the kids going into Ryerson University and think to myself, one day that will be me one day. And sure enough, you know, a few years later, I ended up going to Ryerson. But you know, you're, you, wherever you go, you, you, you are there, you know? So the challenges that I went through continued to haunt me no matter what I did. I mean, I traveled around the world, you know, it was the, the time of hitchhiking around the world to follow the Beatles to India, you know, <laughs> and things like that. And I was no exception. I was an adventurer. And so I did that. That also, I think, helped to make me stronger and more determined. And during that time too, interestingly, I lived with about, well, it was at least 17 different cultures because I wouldn't go somewhere just to visit. I would end up staying there. And so I learned about nutrition and lifestyle at that point in time. And I think that's what propelled me forward with my first undergraduate degree, which was, you know, in biochemistry. And I think that's what did it because it was seeing how other cultures lived and how healthy they were. But what I learned from cancer when I was diagnosed in the mid 80s with cancer, what I learned with cancer was that it's an it's unresolved emotional issues that basically fester, I believe, in your system, you know, probably resulting in, you know, the inflammation or whatever that um, that causes the the problems as you get older or as you develop further uh, from stress, you know, you, you, the, the continual stress, the unresolved emotional issues, the uh, subliminal depression that you carry with from your, your childhood, basically, all those things work together to tear your body down. So that, you know, in the mid 80s, when I was diagnosed with cancer, it was, I think, just the end result of all of that. However, you know, the survivor instinct and the des the, de the desire to find a solution. I mean, initially, I did go through three rounds of chemo. I mean, that I was in the medical world. That's what I knew. But after the third go round, I knew that if I continued that route, I wouldn't be here at all. So if I was going to be here, I wanted some quality while I was here. And that's when I jumped ship and started looking for the alternative methods that were out there, which was very unlike most people in the medical world at that time. Right. And uh, I traveled around the world looking for the magic bullet, magic cure and didn't find it. But what I did find was um, things that kept me going long enough that I could find the next thing to try and the next thing to try. You know, I left no stone left unturned. And I think that's the, the key is, you know, just continuing. You know, I say to people in life, you just keep going until you find the thing that works. Right. Whatever it is, whether it's your, your health or your business or your, you know, there's, it's just that continual propelling forward, never giving up. And so that's what happened. I, and I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Bernie Siegel, who wow. helped me wow. to understand the inner workings of cancer. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And what it changed everything. That was. 
Yeah, it really was. And I mean, I remember the day when I was, I was 88 pounds in a wheelchair, given less than two weeks to live when I met him. Wow. And um, it was a miracle weekend. I call it the miracle weekend when I met Jim the Vitamix man who introduced me to ice, ice chips with nutrition because I hadn't eaten anything for about six months, just sucking, sucking on ice chips to stay hydrated. So that was the number one thing on the Saturday. On the Sunday was when I was dragged off to see Dr. Bernie Siegel. Last thing on the planet that I wanted to do was to be around people. I looked like hell, I felt like hell, and I really didn't want to be anywhere near noise, you know? But um, Dr. Siegel came up to me and he asked me what was going on. And uh, he asked me if I'd ever written a gratitude journal. And I thought, a gratitude journal? Are you out of your freaking tree? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm dying here. <laughs> what have I got to be grateful for? And he, he listed a few things, which, you know, I was there and my friends had brought me there. My daughter had dragged me there, you know, so there were people who cared. And it was like beginning to do something like that was out of it. It was just nothing I had ever done. I was, I'm a scientist, you know, or at least that's what I always used to say. I'm a scientist. I don't buy that stuff. Show me. <laughs> and um, I started doing the gratitude journal as a result of that meeting. And I remember the first day he had said, if you can't think of anything, write the same thing five times. I'm sitting up in Canada in the middle of winter, overcast gray day, which they all are in the winter <laughs> for months at a time. And I looked out the window and I said, God, if you want me to write this gratitude journal, give me something to be grateful for. Give me a sign. And it was not more than a minute or two later, the sun shone through the clouds for just a brief moment. Wow. And to me, that was a sign. And I wrote, dear God, thank you for the sun. Thank you for the sun. Thank you for the sun. Five times. And uh, so that was my first day. A month later, I wrote 137 gratitudes in one day, all different. And you know what they say, what you focus on expands. Oh, totally what you focus on expands. Yeah. And I'm still here today, so it obviously works. Yeah, I, I totally agree and believe in the power of gratitude because my husband and I started this year a gratitude jar. So every day, and of course there's days that we miss, but every day we put one thing we're grateful for. And most of the time I come up with at least three or four things, and then I'll write them especially, and I say, well, that was this way if I forget to write something tomorrow, I've got plenty. Because we're at the end of the year. We we I've always kept a gratitude journal, but I wanted to involve my husband. So the funny thing is now when my children, my grandchildren are here, I have company, I invite them to write something and put it in there. Now, I don't expect people to. I don't tell them they have to. I just say, if you feel like it. One man came to my house. We had a, a meeting of the Florida Speakers Association, and he had forgotten to write it. And the next day he emails me, he goes, I feel so bad. I really wanted to write it and participate. He goes, so here's my gr what I'm grateful for. If you wouldn't mind writing it and putting it in there, because I want you to remember this day and read it. And I thought, wow. So I was grateful for him as well as for all of that. And it's just amazing how that does. You're absolutely right. It expands It expands our our, our, our thinking and, and beliefs and just so many things. I think that it just... It's just an, a, a wonderful thing. If we could only get the rest of the world to participate, you know. Exactly. I it agree. Would be wonderful. <laughs> so instead of focusing on the things that are wrong with everything, how let's focus on the, the wonderful things that we have to be grateful for. Because there is certainly at least one thing every day we can find, I would, I would say. Um, yeah. So obviously you learned a lot from those challenges and recovery. What are some of the things, what are some of the takeaways that, that you would say um, have helped you to get this far in your life? Well, you know, one of the things I really believe so strongly, and it says an expression I have, take five now to save five later. And it's based on my journey of taking, I never took five minutes out for any kind of relaxation, breathing, time with God, time alone, uh, time with nature, never did it. I was a workaholic all the way, working at work I hated, by the way. So one of the things is find your joy, find your passion. And when it's no longer a passion, find the next joy or passion. You have to live with what you love to do to, in order to really impact both your own life and the lives of those around you. Because if you're miserable, the world around oh, you is miserable. 
If mama not right? happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Wow. So, you know, I think taking five minutes, I, you know, when I do my presentations and so on, I say to people, I take five minutes to be peaceful, to, to, to save five years later, you know, to so that, because you don't, if you don't take care of yourself and take that time out, your body can't regenerate. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time. My, I teach my patients five minute strategies. I'm a master of five minute strategies, healthy strategies. And one of them is that time out. You know, it's like, you know how you get bottlenecked in your day and I gotta get this done, I gotta get this done. I've got this, you know, major crunch going on. If you took five minutes and just stepped outside Hugged a tree, whatever it is you enjoy doing. <laughs> I hug my dog. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, what will happen is you'll come back to your work and you'll get a, a lot more done. Oh, I totally. And so, yeah. yeah. So that is one of the, the takeaways, I think, is to just take the time out to be still. And, of course, writing the gratitudes. I also believe that, you know, nutrition, of, obviously, I come from biochemistry as my, my initial background psychology later on um i really do believe you have to take care of this this vehicle that we live in um it doesn't have to be perfection i mean I, people say to me well do i have to give up coffee do i have to give up chocolate most of my women friends will say chocolate and i say no if, if i had to give up those give those up there'd be no reason to be alive anymore <laughs> I mean, I'm partially joking, but goodness gracious, I mean, life has got to have some some treats, right? Right, right. But what I say, yeah, what I say is go for go for quality. Yeah. Have the chocolate, but make it dark chocolate. Have the coffee, but make it organic. You know, so it's really, it's not about giving up things. It's about finding the alternatives that are healthier. And of course, you're not going to live on chocolate and coffee. You know, those are treats. But, but you know, with all of what you put inside your body, make sure that it's the best you can buy, you can afford, and that you can buy, and and to have less of it, but just have the best. I would agree with that, and I think that you know, people live such busy lifestyles that they don't realize that you know, picking up this thing here or that thing there is just. I I mean, I've made bean soup for years, and I always use canned beans. And my daughter says to me, and she's, you know, she's, she's the brilliant one in the family. She goes, mommy, have you ever tried just using regular beans? And I said, well, no, I know how to do it. I've made them before, but it just seems like a lot of work. And so I said, yeah, you know what? I'll buy a pack of beans and just soak them overnight and then just throw them in there. Man, it just, it tastes a hundred percent better. So now my husband's like, oh. oh yeah, at least he, he's like, can we have bean soup in the, in the heat of summer? He wants bean soup and I don't care. It's so good for you. And my husband's got a lot of uh, digestive problems and everything else, so we have to we have to be more careful about what he eats. I I have an iron cat iron ca cast iron stomach. Everybody says because I eat every I eat everything. I don't eat a lot of junk, but I eat everything, and nothing bothers me. But this poor man, you know, we everything bothers him. So um, you know, so you have to. You're right, though. It's easy. Those simple things, and actually, like beans. I, I'm just using that as an example. It's actually less expensive than canned beans if you think about it. Oh, absolutely, way less. So you know, but t it's taking the time. I, I bet my best investment was my crock pot because I could yeah. throw stuff in, yeah. in the morning and have a wonderful meal at night. And and it, you know, it took me less time than if I had to come home and cook at the end of the day. Because then exactly. you know, that whole exactly. process and the stress of cooking, to me, I don't like to cook anyway, but, <laughs> you know. No, me <laughs> but chocolate is very important to me and wine. So so, ener so you, let's talk a little more yes. about, because I'm assuming this is part of your five-minute instant energy tips. So yes. tell us some more. Yes. Give us some more. Well, it, the, it, that's an interesting part about it because energy is written with a, you know, E dot, N dot, E dot, R dot, G dot, uh -huh. Y dot. And the reason is because in after my book was done and it didn't have that written in that format, uh, it was Thanksgiving Day. I sent it off to the publisher. I went to bed and I was going to sleep it until I until I woke up. If it was 10 hours later, great. I had rented eight movies. It was back in Blockbuster Day, uh, just before Blockbuster disappeared, actually. <laughs> and so I rented eight movies. I had cut up all these fresh vegetables, made fresh hummus and fresh tzatziki. I had all this amazing food and, and 
air pop popcorn ready to pop, you know, uh, all everything ready to go and have a relaxing Thanksgiving day. I woke up two hours after I went to sleep and it was energy as an, as an acronym. I'm like, no, the book is done. I'm not spending any more time on this, but I couldn't sleep. So I got up, I wrote to the, I wrote the publisher and said, stop the presses. I think I've got something else to add. Um, of course, they got back to me after Thanksgiving weekend and said, we're not stopping the presses. But then when they saw what I wrote, they said, okay, you've got to write the whole front of the book over wow. because it changed. The whole, yeah. So it was E, the first E is exhale fully first. And my assistant, every time she would come in in the morning and she was stressed out because she was a caregiver with her husband who had had a massive stroke. So she was really stressed out. And I would immediately say to her, exhale fully. So the, she turned to me and said, E, exhale fully. That's it. And I said, you're right. Because if you don't fully exhale, you can never fully inhale. And that comes from my yoga years. You know, so that was the E, the first E. The N is nutrition excellence daily. The next E is exercise for cellular rejuvenation. All this is ex ex explained in detail right. in the book. And then the R is rest, relax, rejuvenate. The um, G is gratitude, attitude, and the Y is your five keys because in instant energy, I have hundreds of different strategies that you can use. So what, what I do with my patients is we find the ones that they will do. So if it's just one strategy from each of those keys, it's their five, five keys. So that's what we say, your five keys or your five strategies. So basically that was what happened. And those are the five keys I learned in India not in quite the same way, but I learned those five keys back in 1970, 71. I taught them without realizing I was teaching them. And then when I sat down to, wrote, to write the book, uh, which was originally going to be a revised edition of Five Minutes to Health, it took on a whole new direction and became, instead of just a nutrition and maybe a little exercise thrown in book, it became a whole person book, Mind, Body, Spirit. And that was really what I wanted to write about, but I never had the courage to do it until I had no choice. It was like a download day after day after day, you know? So, yeah. And when people follow those, I actually had a, a patient who survived cancer and um, she was also an, a graphic artist. So she helped me put my pyramid of energy together. And on that energy, those five keys are listed. And children, it's great when you have ch children and gra grandchildren because you can, go through and check it off. Like we laminated them. Uh -huh. And after quite a while, that's what we were doing was laminating them and selling them at events, et cetera, or throwing them into a bundle. And pe people would get the pens, the um, er erasable pens, right? And they would have their kids mark off when they had had, they had achieved that particular uh, part of the pyramid, you know, the energy, the, the exhaling, the breathing, uh, the nutrition, and then the nutrition is all broken down into the different food groups. And it isn't the traditional food groups we hear about. It's healthy food groups. And so, you know, the whole thing was just designed with that purpose in mind. And you can look at that visually and know whether you're living on track or not health-wise. So it was quite a wow. journey creating all this. So are you, are you writing a, anything new right now? Well, actually... I had an epiphany. <laughs> I'm 66 years old and I have helped clean up the messes of several of my friends who passed away unexpectedly, either from uh, freak accidents or from illness, sudden, sudden diagnosis of cancer and gone. And I came downstairs after a recurring nightmare uh, that really left me screaming. I honestly thought I was being ax murdered by my landlady's son-in-law who used to just enter in because I lost my home with uh, personal losses the year before. And so I had this, this dream, this nightmare. And when I calmed down from it and walked downstairs, I looked at all my beautiful things and I thought, you can't take it with you. And it was interesting because I kept saying, okay, what does that mean? And then I woke up out of a sleep, a very sound sleep. I've meditated and prayed for about three hours one night. And the next day I woke up and it was like, like seeing words across the sky uh -huh. you know, in my bedroom. And it was journey of a thousand days. And I thought, what the heck is this? Okay, God, you're going to have to be more specific than this. Cause I don't know what that means. And when I was coaching a friend 
who is, you know, has been a client for a long time and also a, a very dear friend who knew what I was going through, the changes I was going through, the, the, the feeling that I needed to leave a legacy worth remembering, but I didn't know where to go with it. And yet I was being pushed all the time into a direction. Anyway, I, in the conversation with her, she was having a meltdown. This is a woman who, if you meet her, she's got the world by the tail. You know, got a mil millions of dollars in a contract with, uh, a, you know, a, a large company. Uh, has an amazing relationship. Uh, everything in her life is, it looks like it's flowing, right? So I paraphrased everything and, and reframed everything and said to her, what matters now? And both of us stopped at that moment and realized that is the compelling question. It doesn't matter what race, creed, color, philosophy, religion, background you come from. At some point in your life, you've lost someone, something, or everything that you thought was important. And you've asked yourself, what matters now? And so the next part of my life is actually, I am releasing everything, selling, giving away, donating everything I own, except for a few you know, personal essentials that I wanna keep. Uh, and then I'm heading out and interviewing. I'm gonna do five, 500 interviews in the States uh, first, and that's the pre-journey, and then a thousand interviews in a thousand days around the world. Wow! Asking people that question. So that's so that's that answers the what's next for Dr. Marilyn. Wow! I had no idea. That's very <laughs> exciting. So, what's been the most surprising thing about working in the wellness industry? The most surprising thing, I think, was the lack of compliance that I experienced until I got my, my psychology background uh, covered. Because what I found was people, so th this is from the standpoint of you know coaching and mentoring people. I found that it was really challenging. People would have the, the best intentions to really take care of their health, but unless they were dying suddenly of, of an illness or they were told that they had no hope if they didn't change their diet and their lifestyle, they wouldn't do it. Right. So, and then the, the, they became complacent. They would get, they would lose the weight or they would get their heart back in shape or whatever it was. And then they'd go off the rails again. You know, it would be like they'd go back to their old habits until another prognosis came along, you know, and it was, and that wasn't good. And then they would, oh, Dr. Joyce, help me, please help me, you know, get back on track. And so once I got, I, when I went back to school and got my psychology background, my psychology degree, um, I focused on and, and um, specialized in mind-body medicine, so psychoneuroimmunology, and really looked at what makes people tick. And I went from having probably 25% compliance before, which is pretty high actually, to about 90% wow. compliance. Yeah, and it was just from really honing in on what the underlying issues are that are causing people to not take care of themselves, to do the negative instead of the positive for themselves. So that's the, the perspective of working with patients. In the wellness industry itself, the hardest part about being in that industry is that from one day to the next, the information changes. You know, and uh, you know, you could be teaching something one day and a year later, it's something totally different. And so that's been a really challenging perspective. I mean, I was definitely not in favor of the Atkins diet at all. And yet now we know scientifically that a person who is going through the cancer journey, because it does destroy and, and eat up the lean tissue mass, um, is, it really is important to get, it, it can be vegetable protein, it doesn't have to be animal protein, but they need a high protein diet in order to really be healthy. Well, the same is true if you want to lose weight, if you're eating a lot of carbs, especially simple carbs, you will not lose the weight. If you eat carbs at night, you will pack on pounds. You know, it's like learning when to eat what. And I think because in our generation, our, our day and age anyway, people eat their largest meal day generally at mm -hmm. night. That's a problem for us because truly the healthiest generations before us ate their biggest meals at breakfast and lunch. You know, eat, there, there was a saying a long time ago, and I'm going to reframe it because I'm a woman instead of eating like a king <laughs> you know <laughs> the, the, the expression is eat breakfast like a queen eat lunch like a princess and eat dinner like a pauper 
And I think that there's a lot of validity to that. The people who eat the bulk of their food earlier in the day are going to work it off. If you're eating it at night, one, you're going to have digestive problems because you're eating at a time when the body isn't going to have time to assimilate it properly. And, um, and so it really is urgent, I believe, in our culture because there's so much illness right now, and especially with digestion and, and um, you know, colon issues, et cetera, that I think it's, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're eating too much too late in the day. And I mean, when people tell me that they get up in the morning and have coffee, and then more coffee, and they don't have anything to eat. Breakfast, the, the, the word breakfast is actually, my grandmother used to say it, I'm from Scotland. My Scots last from Okpamokti in Scotland. So my grandmother in her Irish tone, I mean her Scottish tone would say, you've got to have your breakfast. So it's like breakfast is breakfast, right? right? If you look at the two words, yeah. But people get up and the way they break their fast from the night before is with coffee and donuts. Oh, yeah. You know, and, yeah. I don't know the last so, time was I ate a donut. Every once in a while, I do like a bagel, though. Oh, yeah, me too. I, I do love bagels, you know, That's coming cool. from the north. <laughs> Maybe four yeah, right. times a year I'll eat a bagel, but, yeah. I do like breakfast is my favorite meal, but it is true. I think that our um, it's our culture, it's our society, it's how you know we're programmed because everybody's so busy. You know, I work from home, so I I do have my biggest meal during in the middle of the day. I have a, a nice big lunch, a salad with whatever on, yeah. and um, uh, then I try to we try to eat lighter in the evening. But you know, that's not always possible. Sometimes you don't have time to eat a good meal during the day, and then we try to eat good at night, but it's still too much. You know, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, the best thing a person can do is to have like a you know a protein and a salad and maybe some steamed vegetables if you want some steamed vegetables. That would be the the most ideal evening meal, especially as we get older, because we do tend to pack on more pounds if we have too much food and especially carbs at night. And people will say to me, "Well, does it matter what kind of carbs?" Actually, when it comes to the evening hours, it probably doesn't matter what the carbs are. Of course, the simpler the carbs, the worse they are for you. I mean, the the um, white rice or uh, something like that would be just, it just turns to sugar in your system. And white potatoes are basically the same. Right. So ideal, if you're going to have any kind of quote unquote carb, it should be something like quinoa, which is actually more of a, uh, the, the net carb level is low because it's actually a complete protein as far as grains go. Yeah. Quinoa is good if you yeah. if you know how to cook it. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah, I mean it's uh, I use it. What I'll often do is cook it in, in a vegetable broth. Mm -hmm. You know, so it takes on a lot of nice flavors as well. Yeah. So well, my daughter yeah. does CrossFit, so she's very into the nutrition and everything, and she knows how to eat just before a, a match and all of that. And she's taught me a lot. I've I've learned more from her than I think I ever taught her as far as how to eat well when she was growing up. <laughs> so, thank goodness that, you know, there are people who do care about their, their bodies and their systems and how yes. they're running because it's like an, it's like an automobile. I believe our, our oh. car, our body is our, is our vehicle, as you said. And, um, uh, you know, it has, the oil needs to be changed every once in a while. You got to change to check the tire pressure. You got to do all of that. So I think, I think you're absolutely right. Um, let's talk about running a business because we're running out of time. And I want to, I, want, oh I have a couple of quick questions I want to ask you. So tell us what a typical sure. day is like for you. Tell, tell us what, a typical, sir, sir. a typical day. What is a typical day like for you? Well, I will admit that I am one of the worst for getting on the internet right away. But because I'm often being asked to be on radio shows or uh, some sort of media programs, I need to look at that first because I need to respond quickly to those kinds of things. Right. So, I'm, you know, because they always say email is somebody else's agenda. And I agree if it's regular emails. So I tend to be very careful to look at the right emails, uh, although social media does grab me sometimes. Um, I love going on social media and posting. But um, the, my typical day would be looking at the emails to see who I need to respond to, um, making phone calls as quickly as possible if I have phone calls or responding by email if that's the preferred choice, and getting that done right away. I like to take uh, about an hour 
to write because um, and with the journey, we're putting together blog posts. We haven't, we haven't posted them yet, but we're putting together all the blog posts to put up because it's, it gives you better Google, uh, you know, uh, pats on the back from Google yeah, if you yeah. tend to put a lot of stuff up at one time. So we're putting all that together. I'm Generally speaking, I'm working with a web guy probably about half an hour a day just to make sure that we're starting to put things in the right order, you know, like we did with my Dr. Marilyn Joyce site and my Kit Cancer in the Can. It took a lot of work to put those up once they were up that, you know, you just make changes as you go, but but it's there. So, you know, it's just about a half an hour working with them. I'm out working on a new project with another partner and it's like putting out a book a month between the two of us. And um, he's in the sales industry and I'm in the health industry but it's the journey, the, all the interviews that, that we're going to be putting up. So setting up interviews as well wow. for the journey. Uh, so that's about an hour a day I'll spend on that. Um, I do take a lot of time to just get up and walk, you know, to go outside, hug a tree, um, you know, talk to the plants, water the plants, whatever. Um, and so that's a part of the day because it gives me, it refreshes me to come back. I like to work in the evening. I'm a night person. So that's when I might do, um, you know, the things that are more contemplative, uh, you know, deciding on posts that I want to put up that have meaning for, for the different things I'm doing. Um, you know, really, truly, I love the, I love my life because I've created a life now where I'm not going out to work for somebody. Although oftentimes I might, if I'm speaking outside, I have to be up and out, you know, but that's a joy. Um, but other than that, I, a lot of my work is on, it's a laptop lifestyle. You know, I always said that's what I wanted and that's what I've created. And today we're so blessed because we have, this is my first experience with Blab, but we have Blab, we have Periscope, we have, you know, Hangouts. You're so blessed. I mean, we can do anything anywhere. Yeah. So, you know, and of course, splat, splattered amongst all that, I'm a, a snacker. I don't usually eat one big meal, so I'll, I might have uh, you know a uh, light breakfast and then a mid morning snack and then lunch and you know so whenever I feel the need for something, I'm not a person who eats just because it's meal time. I eat when my body tells me to eat. So so uh, you know and, and I hate cooking, so it has to be really simple stuff <laughs> that's natural. And yeah. <laughs> I did all that cooking when my kids were cooking. <laughs> Uh, well, we, we served our time, Heidi. Yeah, we did it when I, our kids were younger. Right? While my children were growing up. I, I mean, I there are times I like to cook. I get, you know, yes. you get that feeling like, I love Thanksgiving. I love, I cook all day on Thanksgiving. And I, and it's just, to me, it isn't work. To my family, it looks like a lot of work, but I love it. And it's only yeah. because I only do it once a year. So there's a lot of joy. And then seeing everybody sitting down at the table, we usually have like 15 to 20 people. To me, that's the part that makes it all worth sitting in the kitchen or standing in the kitchen, cutting potatoes, all of that stuff. We have to do. I agree. I mean, I feel the same way, like Christmas or uh, Thanksgiving or even New Year's are fun times. I mean, Thanksgiving might be, I mean, New Year's might be different. This is like taking all the leftovers and coming up with something unique and interesting, right? Uh -huh. I, I feel the same way as you. I mean, I enjoy those kinds of things. And I'm, I'm a salad. That I'm the queen of salads. Too. I love salad. salad. Yeah. So whenever I'm going somewhere for a potluck or whatever, or a meeting, I will make a gigantic salad and with everything in it, but the kitchen sink. And so, you know, that kind of thing I love doing. If I know that some somebody else is going to enjoy it, I think that, and I, it doesn't mean that I don't think I'm worth it. You know, I mean, I think that I'm worth healthy food, but I like to keep it simple for myself. And then when it's the more complicated stuff, it's when I'm going somewhere, you right. know, and showing a little, yeah. you know. No, it does. <laughs> not it, my it's, to me, when you want to spend time on something, to me, it should be something you really, really love doing. My husband loves to cook. So even though he works all day, he's like, oh, I'll cook dinner tonight. I'm like, okay. If you really want to, I'm not going to argue. <laughs> I'll set the table. Exactly. I have no problem with that. So, what books are you currently reading? What books am I currently reading? Well, I'm reading *The Extraordinary Mind* by Vishen Lakiani. 
Um, I love the concepts that he speaks about, when especially the brules, which uh, I, won't, I won't describe what they are, but <laughs> well, I will. They're the BS rules, you know. So um, I really enjoy that. I'm actually, I, you know, I think more than anything, what I do is I do a lot of research online. So I'm often reading articles more than books. Mm -hmm. Although, oh, the other book that I absolutely love is a book called Surren The Surrender Experiment. Oh. I'm trying to remember the author's name. I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but um, I'll oh, look it up. Yeah, it's really a wonderful book because it. I've had to look at, you know, it, it was a gift to me at Christmas time when I was realizing that I was taking this new path and, uh, and having to surrender. Because when you're letting go of all your things that you thought you'd never let go of, you know, the beautiful things that you've collected over your life, and well you know 30 40 years so it's like I as I was letting go of those things I was having to surrender you know I reminding myself that everything is just borrowed and that we, we don't get to keep anything because when we leave we it's gone we're we're gone and it's here <laughs> so exactly right for a yeah. little while longer you know I uh, um, a professional organizer, organizer gave me a great uh, tip she said to me have your children look at what you have and ask them what they want when you're gone. And those yeah. are the things you want to keep. And the other stuff is totally unnecessary. It's if you want to keep it fine, but it's not something you have to keep. And and that has always stuck with me. Although I've not, you know, I've got pictures on the walls that are like since they were little kids. And, you know, I, yeah. can't, get, I can't take them down. But I know that I need to, you know. And it's like <laughs> that brings me joy, though. So, um it, but it does make it easier to get uh, to um, cut the ties emotionally from things when you know that when you're gone, that if this stuff doesn't have any meaning when you're gone, then probably it's not anything you need right now. You know, it's true. It's true. And I, you know, it's interesting. I, I reflected back on my father. My mother was not that way, but my father. They were, of course, divorced for most of the time that I was alive. But my father, before he died, it was funny, about three or four years before he died, he started clearing stuff away. It wasn't because he thought he was going to die. He just had found that he didn't need all those things. Right. But it was almost like on some unconscious level, it was like, I'm getting older. I might live forever. But in the meantime, let's get rid of this stuff. And what happened was he cleared the space for his true passion, which was art. Wow. And he had never given himself permission until he was in his 70s to actually learn how to, you know, do things other than uh, draftsman work. So now he's actually doing the creative stuff. And before he died, he actually had three gallery showings of his artwork. Oh, so, how yeah, I mean, it gives me goosebumps even talking about it. But that realization that life doesn't stop just because we're getting older, but it does take a different form which may require that we have to empty the space to make room for more to come in, right? We, with our closets, isn't that the key thing? It's like the minute you start letting go of stuff, all of a sudden you start getting some really good new stuff. Exactly. Yeah. It seems to open up the doors, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So uh, uh, what, what thing would you like to share with our audience that you perhaps we haven't had time to talk about? Do you know, I know I, I have mentioned this, but I would say that if you're in an area of, of work that you, you absolutely hate, it's gonna kill you eventually, and probably more, than, more quickly than eventually. And I, I've watched way too many patients do all the right things health-wise, you know, nutrition, diet, lifestyle, um, but they were in a job that sucked the energy out of them. And they were with people that zapped their energy as well you know what, what I call toxic and uh, toxic people and um, I would say really evaluate your life and decide who you really want to have in your life and what you really want to do with your life and maybe as if you're getting older what kind of legacy you would like to leave it doesn't have to be grandiose mm -hmm. You know, it's, it doesn't have to be extraordinary. It just has to be something that gives you joy and peace and a sense of um, contribution. I think the biggest thing we can do is contribute to humanity and starting, you know, locally. Wow. 
Uh, what, what great advice. I could sit here and talk to you all day long. Honestly, you just, you're just fascinating. And thank you so much for all of your wonderful uh, tips and your wisdom and your inspiration and absolutely for sharing your story. How can our audience get in touch with you? What's the best way? Well, there's two primary ways, and one is the website journeyof1000days.love, L-O-V-E, um, and the other is on Facebook. That's where we are building a, di we hope to have a really dynamic community anyway, at facebook.com forward slash journeyof1000days, and it's the number 1000 in both cases. So those would be the probably the best ways to, to uh, connect because I'm always on that page on Facebook and I'm all, you know, we are really building and we're going to have a lot of new blog posts going up in probably about 10 days to 14 days from now. So there'll be a lot of information about how the journey started to unfold and where it's been going uh, since I got this vision last September. So when are you starting your journey? It sounds like you've already started it to some degree. You know, real quickly, that that is exactly what happened. When I was forced to move all my stuff into storage units, I never really believed that that was, I was so frustrated and angry that that had to happen. However, my journey began there and the people who run the storage unit, they've, this, they've become, of course, very dear friends because I've been there so much. But <laughs> on, top <of> that, <laughs> on top of that, they actually were the ones who said to me, do you realize that your journey has actually already begun? The people I've met, the people who have I've allowed God to just bring the people who really would love my things to come and buy them for next to nothing, of course, but to, to get them. And then they send me photographs of what it looks like in their home. So in a sense, that really has been a large part of the beginning of this journey, just surrendering into it and meeting all these amazing people and sharing their stories. And many of them will be interviews that will be included. Wow. on the blog site yeah that's wonderful i just want to thank you again dr dr Marilla joyce for being with us today and sharing about your journey and giving us some great advice for our health and our well-being uh, again we've been speaking with dr Marilyn joyce author of several books including the five minutes to health i can't believe it's tofu and instant energy the five keys to unlimited energy and vitality Dr. Joyce, have a wonderful day, and thanks so much for being with us. You too, Heidi. Thank you so much. And everybody, be sure and tune in to entrepreneurs.com and check out our upcoming shows. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.